Um, uh, so, so let's go, okay, so that's me again. All these amazing titles. <laughs> it just keeps on building. It's all, yeah, king of the universe, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so we're going to talk about OCD. Um, and I think it's good to think about what it is. I had a couple of conversations with people about different types of OCD. And, and again, Ashley and, 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 and myself and others have uh, been repeatedly thinking, oh, well, there's ROCD and there's Hitch OCD and POCD. Yeah, you're shaking your head because it's, it's right. The, 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 the principles are pretty much the same across the board. And it all kicks off from the idea that an obsession is something which comes into your head. So it's an intrusive thought, image, impulse, or doubt. So kind of add the doubt in. Um, which seems to signal danger which you can cause or prevent. Um, so and it might be that you're going to do something or, 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 or cause something or, or that something's going to happen and you can stop it. And that's what an obsession is. And a compulsion is some sort of action or reaction which is intended to do two things. It's both intended to prevent the danger which has come into your head, um, but also you know, to, to, to kind of make sh to try and rule out any sense of responsibility, to sort of get, be absolutely certain that you're not going to be to blame if anything uh, were to happen and so on. Now, the history of OCD is really interesting um, because you know, I can, you know, I'm sure you could all give me a nice, an epidemiology of OCD. So if I ask, ask you, what, how many people, this is a question for you, Ashley Curry, how many people suffered from OCD about AIDS in 1673? <laughs> Sorry? Zero. Zero. You see, he got it exactly right to the number. So he's a genius, an epidemiological genius. Okay. <laughs> Why is that? So, so, so what were people worried about in 1678 or whatever? And, well, actually, generally, they were worried um, about things like blasphemy. Um, uh, and so on. And, and the history of OCD and the distribution of OCD in different cultures basically says it's whatever the invisible menace is. And the invisible menace is the thing that pops in your head. And, that, and these days, it can be sexual abuse, it can be, it can be HIV AIDS or mad cow disease or, or whatever. And that's a really important thing. So it's culturally specific and that culture could be the microculture of your family. So OCD, in my view, is not meaningless. OCD hits you precisely at your weakest point, precisely in the area that is most important to you. So if you're, if you, if you, if you're a clean person, you get worried about contamination. If you're a, a gentle person, you worry about violence. If you're a loving parent, you, wor you worry about harming your children. It's not neutral in terms of content. It's, it's about something you don't want to have happen. And not surprisingly, a sense of responsibility means you try and discharge it, if you're a person of, with values, a person where, where things matter, by stopping it from happening. And that's what hand-washing and checking and neutralising in your head and trying to push the thoughts out, that's what they're about. And there's a, really lo there's a logical line between the obsession and the compulsion. And, of course, there's a notion of disorder. Now, there's a lot of discussion out there about whether it's possible to be a little bit OCD. Now, in general, I find it very unhelpful to say I'm a bit OCD. And we heard this morning about you know, somebody saying they're a bit OCD. However, the fundamental unit of OCD is, avail is there in everyone. And that's the intrusive thought. Yeah? And, the intr and the combination, the perfect storm of an intrusive thought, image, impulse, or doubt, together with that being misinterpreted as a sign that, that, that you can be responsible for someone is what motivates, motivates um, the compulsive behaviour. And the compulsive behaviour is invariably under voluntary control. It's people trying too hard to be clean, trying too hard to be certain, trying too hard to be 100% certain and so on, which is sort of good news because that is the heart of what keeps OCD going. And it is something that people are choosing to do. Now, you might get very good at it, like you might get very good at, at texting or, or, or driving your car and so on, which means that it isn't requiring so much thought. But still, it's something that people are choosing to do, which means that in the right circumstances, people can choose not to do it. But that's a very hard thing to do, and that's partly what today's session's about. It becomes a disorder when it messes with your life, where it stops you doing things that are important, where it turns into some sort of hell of distress and unhappiness. And I think many people in this room have been to hell, been to that hell, and 
or, and or have seen their loved ones go to that hellish place. And, and it is hellish, and, and, and yeah, there's no disguising that. So, OCD, unacceptable thoughts, images, impulsive doubts, but they're entirely normal in, in the fact that they occur. And one of the things that's interesting, if you look at, if you look, say, even in children, children have intrusive thoughts about the same things as adults do. If you take the intrusive thoughts, images, impulses, and doubts that people with OCD have, put them on cards, and then take the, the thought, thoughts, images, impulses, and doubts that people don't have OCD have, mix them all together, and give them to really significant experts like that, David Veal and Ashley Curry and Diana and all these people, they can't tell the normal ones from the abnormal ones, just in terms of what's in they're, they're completely identical. They're no, there's no difference. It's not that people with OCD are thinking differently. It's that they're reacting strongly and then behaving differently. And that's what's sitting at the heart of this. So some people are vulnerable to reacting more strongly. And we don't really know, again, we're back to not knowing what the cause is. We don't really know <coughs> why it is, but there are some guesses that we can make. Um, and um, the, you know, we know that, for example, a particular event can do that. So that, that the people have the thing, we, we, in, in jargon, we call it a critical incident. Let me tell you, let me tell you a story. This is, this is a slightly disguised story that, um, that, that, that we put in an article somewhere. So, so, it's not, so I've changed some of the details. But a, it was a woman I saw in her 40s, and she told me about the fact... You know, and she had, she had the thing called thought-action fusion. She thought if she thought something, it would happen, yeah, uh, uh, and so on. And I said, well, you know, if you think that, you must have a reason for thinking that. Because if people think things, you've got a reason for it. You heard it on the radio or something happened or what. And, she's, and I said, well, is there something that tells you? I said, yes, yes, I've never told anybody, but I killed my grandmother. I said, what do you mean? And she told me a story um, about when she was a little girl and she had the best grandmother in the world. Now, you probably think you had the best grandmother in the world, but anyway, she was certain she had the best grandmother in the world. This lovely woman basically would pick her up from school on Friday, every Friday, would pick her up from school and... She'd go home with Granny, and Granny would toss her to bake cakes. Granny also taught her how to play poker and how to cheat at poker. So she clearly was a particularly good Granny, and did all these nice <laughs> things with her. And then, on, and then she'd stay overnight on Saturday night, and on sa Saturday morning, Mum would come and take Granny and the little girl um, you know, back home. And then Granny would stay the weekend and, and teach her more poker cheating, or, or whatever it was. And... And that was all lovely, and she absolutely adored this. And then one day, Granny, Granny picks her up from school, and she's very, very slow, and she's grumpy, and she's snappy, completely uncharacteristic. And she, gets, she takes home, she doesn't make cakes, she sits in an armchair, and after an hour of this, the little girl just wishes, you know, just, wish, just, just wishes the, the old cow would get her, her, her ass into gear. And, and then the granny, granny picks up the phone, calls Mum, and says... Um, you can pick her up, I can't manage her today. And so mum comes, picks her up, and as she leaves, a little girl wishes the old cow would die, which is exactly what she did later that night. She died. And the little girl can't tell her mum because she just killed her grandmother. Yeah, And so she can't tell anybody. And in her, in her mind, she grows up thinking that, that what you think can come true. So having a discussion, that, and that would be an example of a critical incident. That's really bad luck, really bad luck. And, and you can't leave that, you know, again, if somebody says, well, it happened, there's no point in saying that's not true. So, so we have a bit of discussion about this. And, and I, well, I'll tell you what worked out. It's a long discussion. It took us most of an hour to discuss it. Uh, and they said, well, one possibility is that you, kill, that, that, you, that you cause your grandmother's death. The other, by your thought, but the other possibility is your grandmother's death caused the thought. And that was, and, and we had that discussion. And, and of course, that's what happened. Because there's Granny having a heart attack and she's protecting a little girl because she loves the little girl more than anything else in the world. And she doesn't want, you know, she's trying to pretend that nothing's happening as, as the pain gets worse and, and so on. And we, we don't know the details, but something like that. And so she calls mum and sends her home. And because she does this very unusual thing, the little girl has the thought. And, and so the, the grandmother's death caused the thought. 
And that would be an example of extremely bad luck in a very caring person. She grew up to be a very caring person. And that combination of a caring person and that terrible experience yeah, meant that she developed her OCD and, and lived with it for many, many years. And there's all, that's, nobody else will have that story. Nobody else. But there's, there's always, in my experience, something that makes sense for what goes on. Now, it's not how therapy works. It's not about... It's not about we have to get to the root of what caused it in order to deal with it. You don't. But sometimes it's helpful to have an explanation of what went on because it's not random. And if, it, if something like that, important like that, if you left that alone, then it would be very hard for her to wish other people to die, which is one of the things she went on to do. And so far, I'm quite well. So and that was about 15 years ago. So I seem to have survived um, and so on. Okay. So, what we're saying is that obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah, this is just a repeat of what I said this morning, that unacceptable intrusions are an everyday occurrence for everyone. When intrusions have occurred, the obsessional patient believes they might be responsible for harm if they don't react to try and prevent it, and they respond by trying too hard to get rid of the thought, to be 100% certain, and you can never be 100% certain, but if you believe that's important, that's what you do, and the solution becomes the problem, and actually... This thing that people are doing deliberately, the compulsive behaviour or the neutralising or the prayers or, or the avoidance or the thought suppression, that's what's keeping the problem going, which is why, of course, exposure and response prevention is so helpful. So, if you've got OCD and you do compulsions, stop it. <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? It isn't that simple. So, let's go on a bit. Let's think... Like this. It's not as simple as that, although it is as simple as that. And the reality is if you have OCD and you can confront your fears and you do nothing in reaction to them, you will get better. But my God, that's the most difficult thing in the world to do. So it's so easy for me to say and so difficult for you or a person involved to do it. So, the road to recovery, yeah? And, yeah... Has anyone ever recovered from OCD? Ashley Curry, has anyone ever recovered from OCD? Yes. Only one person then. 70%. 70%, okay. It is true, it is true that people recover from OCD, and that's really important. And some people recover from OCD and we never hear from them again. Yeah, and that's great, that's as that is, because they move on. And actually, you know, there's some people in this room, and, 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 and I'm looking at a couple of them, um, in this room who've recovered from OCD and carry on. But actually, by and large, the right thing to do is, if you recover from OCD, is to not ever come to OCD uh, action ever again, because, because you want to get on with your life. It's about reclaiming life. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. So how was it done? What did they need to do it? And some people do it themselves. I'm absolutely clear, and I have met people who have overcome OCD on their own, without any help from other people. And these are extraordinary people who've been extraordinarily lucky in some way. So you have bad luck, you're going to have good luck. And it's not, you know, nobody, if anybody's thinking, oh, I should have done that, well, forget it, leave now, that's rubbish. Of course you can't. But some people can. Um, and it, you can unpick what people needed to do it. And, and that relates in part to this thing that I also talked about this morning, which is the idea that people get anxious because they think situations are more dangerous than they really are. What you're going to do is, and this could be treatment, but there are other ways of getting there and self-help websites uh, and OCD action um, support groups might do the same thing. But actually give people the flexibility to start thinking, well, maybe it's not that I'm a murderous mother. Maybe I'm a loving mother who's afraid of being a murderous mother. And if you can start to consider that, that's great. And then you then have to pull in the evidence that that might be true and then you have to test it out, which might, mean, which might mean terrible things like cuddling your baby while you have the thought of harming them. That's a terrible thing. You should never do that, should you, Diana? <laughs> oh, you're disagreeing with me. Okay, no, that's fine, because that's exactly what you need to do. But my God, the courage that it would take, the courage that people have to show to do that. So the other thing you need is massive courage. And then the other thing you need is support. And if you do not have the appropriate support, that can be difficult. So some people can manage it without support. I've never had OCD. 
Um, I do not think I could, I, if I did have OCD, I do not think I could manage without support. I need support in so many other areas of my life uh, and so on. But some people can. But generally, if you're, you know, if you're most people, you're going to need support. So that's important too. So you have to test it out. So the road to recovery depends on working out how the world really works. Because if it is true that you're going to murder your children, then social services should be in there and taking the children away. If that's what's really going on, if it is true that you're a dirty, toxic, contaminated lump that is going to spread HIV through the southern counties, then you need to get washing. Yeah? But if it's not true, if it's actually that you're super sensitive to this, then you need to get dirty and you need to get slinging knives around uh, or, or whatever it is. So... And the important message from that, if you want to get better, is, is treatment is something that you do, not something done to you. If somebody's doing treatment to you, sack them. It's not, it's not how it works. Recode, the rec road to actually getting better is through a process of making sense of it, understanding how things really work, or at least having some idea, being more flexible in your thinking, and then testing it out. Sometimes you're going to need the help of another expert because, you know, you're an expert in what's going on with you. Yeah, I might possibly be an expert in the kind of things that might help people and other therapists might be. And that's when therapists come in. So, and if you're going to do treatment, which is going to help you get rid of your OCD, there's an agenda. And as a CBT therapist, I'm very keen on agendas. I think they're really important. And I think that things that should be on the agenda, if you are seeing a therapist, is... Here's where we start. And I was talking to somebody about this earlier. I can't remember who. Um, uh, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the thing about getting to... The, as, a, as a therapist, I'm so keen to get to know the person before I get to know their problem. It is really important. And you know what? That's a two-way thing. Because as I get to know the person, they get to know me. You know, and if I'm asking you some questions about yourself and finding out about you, the questions I ask are going to tell you something about me. And by the way, I'm going to start the whole therapy process by saying, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. Are there any questions you'd like to ask me before I start? And I've got some questions you might ask your therapist later. And one of the things I'd say is, at any point, you can do that. Has anyone got any questions? <laughs> I'm serious. Please, yeah. What about personal disclosure? Personal disclosure is fine. I mean, it depends what the disclosure is. I mean, I, you know, it, necess, there's some disclosure that's necessary. Um, the, 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 the problem with disclosure is the potential for misunderstanding. I do a lot of training of people. And, if, and, 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 and the thing that would make me unhappy about what somebody's doing in terms of disclosure is to say, oh, yeah, I had that. You know, you know that problem you're telling me about? I had the same thing. Oh, that depression? Yeah, I had the same thing. Because you didn't. You know, because the bottom line is they're sitting on the other side and you didn't have it. However, I will tell you, I will happily, I'll happily disclose things about the kind of things that happen to everybody and they happen to me. So, for example, a lot of people in this room probably already know that when my daughter was very little, when I was washing her bottom in the bath, I had this frightening thought that she was going to remember it later as sexual abuse. Yeah. And I didn't stop washing her. And, but I remember thinking, there's one of those thoughts. Yeah. And, 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 and now I didn't develop OCD. I'm not claiming that's OCD, but I am claiming that's one of the building bricks of OCD. And that was there. And that's, again, why it's, it's not a little bit OCD, but it's just one of the building bricks. And then the other example, which I've used personally, was about... Um, it was about mushroom picking. And then I kind of had three hours worth of OCD. So name is Shalkovskis, right? Eastern European. Uh, any Eastern Europeans? Any Eastern Europeans here? And mushrooms. Do you like mushrooms? These bloody English. They don't pick mushrooms. You go, in, you go into the forest and, there, and there's all these amazing mushrooms. When you pick them, they look weirdly at you because they think they're poisonous toadstools. Anyway, so when I go mushroom picking, two bags, right-hand bag, um, with, with, with the things, yeah, chanterelles and seps and the things that I'm absolutely certain to eat. And I know what to eat. But I also take a, the left-hand bag, which is the, the stuff which I don't know. Yeah, and so I put the stuff... Anyway, so, so I'm in Barnsley, and, I, and I've never been to this wood before. And, 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 and Barnsley woods are great for mushrooms. And so I've picked, I've picked seps, I've picked chanterelles, and I've... 
wood bluets. There's all kinds of good things in there. And then on the left-hand side, loads of new mushrooms I've never seen before. Anyway, so I take it home and, a, and a, I'll put it on the kitchen surface and I say, all these mushrooms I don't know. And then there's the edible ones over here and that's for my supper. And, and then I, and I've got Roger Phillips' book. And Roger Phillips' book tells you about mushrooms. So you look at, I'm looking up all these mushrooms. Now there are seven species of poisonous mushrooms in the UK. I had picked six of those. <laughs> Six out of seven. I can't remember which one I hadn't picked. And they've got names like Destroying Angel. That's a good name, isn't it? Yeah, and Roger Phillips' book, have a look at Roger Phillips' book, look up Destroying Angel, doesn't just tell you it's poisonous, it tells you how you die in detail with the pain and the time course and so on. So I scoop all these poisonous mushrooms up with my gloves on and put them in a bin and then I wrap it in another bin and then I wrap it in a bin bag and I wrap it up and I throw it away and... and uh, and then I, I scrub the top and then I throw the, the cloth away and I scrub the top again and I use disinfectant and I throw the edible ones away and so on. And about yeah, three hours later, I'm, I'm quite happy it's all clean and I'm not going to die the way Roger Phillips told me. So that's kind of the closest I came to OCD. But it's not OCD and I was fine after that and so on. It was an interesting and salutary thing. So that's the kind of experience. It is perfectly reasonable to share genuine experiences and experiences of images and dreams and nightmares. But it's never what you've experienced. It's just, here's an example. And if I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to say, what does this mean to you? How is it? Uh, uh, And so on. Uh, So so that was a very long answer to a very short question. Is that okay? You got it? Okay. It's a very helpful story. Good. Thank you. I like stories. I use a lot of stories and metaphors uh, in therapy because, as far as I'm concerned, stories and metaphors are about understanding um, and, and I'm interested in helping people make sense of it because if you can make sense of it, then it makes it easier to then deal with it. Okay, so someone, some time to understand me as well as my problems discussion on how best to deal with questions and that's that up front particularly if somebody's seeking a lot of reassurance because that can interfere <coughs> we talked a little bit about this this morning I'm not going to dwell on it but 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 it's good to actually have it up front what are you going to do about that allowing me to share their story and again as far as I'm concerned this is people people I mean, this is an extraordinary thing you do you walk into my office and 25 minutes later you're telling me about some of the worst things that have ever happened to you, and you're probably crying, and I'm beginning to get to the point of crying too. And it's extraordinary. And it's a level of trust. And you need to earn that trust as a, as a therapist, and you need to make sure that you've got a therapist who isn't going to then go, kind of thing. And I know it happens, and I'm sorry that it happens, but it does. Okay, so I, you've got to take, I've got to take the view that if you're allowing me to share your story, that is a privilege for me. I need to, we need to work out what we're up to. And, yeah, and, 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 and actually, that's a joint thing, but typically it's coming from the, the person I'm talking to rather than me. I'm going to do general assessment. I'm going to find out if you're suicidal, because it's important. If you're suicidal, I kind of need to know that. I'm not going to discharge you because you're suicidal, but I kind of, I've got a duty of care, and I'm hoping that you'd be pleased that I have a duty of care. And so on. Anyway, I'm going to do a specific assessment, and... I'm going to find out how the problem works. And this is the thing which, uh, there isn't time to explain it, but I would call it a shared understanding. So the end point of therapy, not the end point of assessment, not therapy, the end point of assessment is something called a shared understanding. And it's like putting together, and it's a really approximate thing, and it develops all the way through therapy. That's good CBT. And the shared understanding often has historical stuff in it. Again, people who say CBT is just about the present are wrong. The, the things which have happened to you are extremely important. Okay, and then there's this thing we call theory A, theory B. Theory A, you are a wicked woman who is in danger of, of harming your children. Or you're a loving mother who's just scared shitless of harming your kids. Yeah? Because if, if theory A is right, then social services, the works, you know? If theory B is right, then you need to cuddle those kids. Well done on cuddling those kids. And, and the same is true for everything. It basically, it, it's about it's people being stuck in theory A. My problem is that I'm a dirty, toxic, contaminated blob, blob um, or blub. <laughs> dirty, uh, uh, my, my house is going to be burgled. My problem is a real-world problem. My problem is that I'm a blasphemer. 
uh, and, and so on. Or my problem is I'm a religious person who's got trapped in a particular way of thinking. It's about that flexibility and, and looking at things in a different way. And then helping you confront your fears. And it's don't trust me, it's find out for yourself and then help me to generalise changes. And relapse prevention. That's, there we are, that's what therapy is. Okay. Please. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, as long as you like. Okay. <coughs> um, again, I'm going to make these available to OCD Action. So I think, will you guys be putting it on the website? Or, yeah, so, so it'll, all, it'll all be, including the ones that I'm not going to show because I've got many more slides that I can do. Please, yeah, just, just shout out because so, um, my eyes are a bit. Mm. Some of the examples you use, like cuddling, yeah. being afraid of your children, yeah. cuddling. Yeah. So that's black and white in compared to some fixations, like mine is asbestos, uh -huh. is a harmful yeah. thing. And well, well, do, you think, do you think killing your children is not harmful? No, but if you expose uh. yourself to cuddling your child yeah, yeah. as a therapy, that's not going to harm you. But, 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 but Diana, does that feel, if you're cuddling your child, if you've got OCD about that and you're cuddling your child, does that feel harmful? When you're in the grip of it, not now, but in the grip of it, I, 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 think, I think you might be making a category mistake here. It, but basically, you know, we could put, we could, you know, we could take somebody who's afraid of, of murdering their children mm. and tell them about the best. Asbestos. So people are worried about, you know, grey roofing. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, because the real difficulty is that I might, you know, push my fingers into the baby's fontanelle. No, no. Yeah. I, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had those sort of things as yeah. well. But my, my point is, in terms of therapy, yeah. how do you expose yourself? Oh, to that's, a diff that that's a different story. But yeah. the point is that every OCD I've ever come across had a basis in reality. Right. And that includes blasphem blasphemy. You know, yeah. If you have blasphemous thoughts. Well, look, if you're a religious person, you know that you're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity, which is A, unpleasant, and B, a long time. You know, yeah. so, 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 so it's... It's always real, and, and people wouldn't do it if it wasn't real. So, so don't make the mistake of thinking asbestos or HIV or whatever, they're, they're somehow more real than, than blasphemy or, or, or child violence. Okay, now, so the issue is, now I am, I'm actually rather a careful man, yeah? I mean, that may, you know, when people watch me put my hands down in laboratories and so on, people don't think so, but I am extremely careful. And I get people to do things like hold knives. I've got a very sharp sabbatia in my drawer. And I take people with OCD and ask them to, you know, after appropriate preparation, ask them if they would mind holding the knife to my throat. Um, uh, and they do, and so on, yeah. I know for sure, I, I've made very certain of my diagnosis. If there's command hallucinations, something called command, I wouldn't be doing it, or, or, or whatever. Now, so, so HIV, let's take HIV around than asbestos. Yeah, I, I worked with somebody who, who actually was working in a laboratory that had live HIV. And one of the things we did, we went to the coffee. And, and yeah, she didn't need to, to, when she got home, take all her clothes off outside the door, rush into the shower, and, and all the things that she did. OK. And what she didn't need to do was to avoid the coffee room. But we, so, so she invited me as a colleague into the coffee room. And we went to the, where the coffee is. And the little brown blobs. And we <laughs> did those little brown blobs. Now, now it's in the coffee room. Right? There's little brown blobs of bits of dried coffee or whatever, but they're terrifying. As far as she's concerned, they're there. Similarly with asbestos, you know, things, things which are grey in colour, even to, touching those. You wouldn't do that if you're afraid of asbestos and so on. So I don't do anything dangerous. I never do anything dangerous. There's, but there's, there's a bit of a crossover, because I do sometimes do anything da something dangerous. Some of you will have seen on TV. Yeah, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I put my hand down, I've put my hand down my lavatories for the last 40 years and licked my fingers and so on. Bottom line is, I might get the shits. It's just true. You know, it's possible. And, and actually, when people point that out, I say, yeah, you're right. It's just really, and this is not something that is generally recommended. But if you've got the choice between a week's worth of the shits or OCD for the rest of your life, what are you going to choose? And I'm, go I'm quite happy to risk it. Now, so far, I've been terribly lucky, and today's probably the day I won't be, you know, but... but <laughs> And, so, and, 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 and actually, it sort of comes out the point where, you know, that the, there is a finite risk that if you touch that grey thing, there might, there might, you might possibly be bass you might possibly pick up a fibre, you might possibly get mesothelioma. It's actually rather unlikely, but it is possible. And, and I can't guarantee you that it won't happen, but I can guarantee you that if you carry on doing all this stuff, you'll suffer from OCD for the rest of your life, and your life, I don't know what your life is like, but I'm guessing that it might really have 
impaired the quality of that life. And you can re reclaim that if you simply take the risk that everybody else takes. And, and it is true that I certainly have picked up sheets of roofing and, and, and moved them around. And, and so far, I'm doing all right. But I can't guarantee that that will always be the case. And so there's always a reality behind OCD. Always a reality. And you've got to stand back and say, OK, and at some level, if I, if I thought, well, if I didn't wash my hands and there was a real possibility my, my two lovely children would die because I washed my hands, then I'm going to wash my hands. Except it's not just washing my hands. I'm washing my hands now and tomorrow and the next day and all day on Sunday and then the next week and the next month and the next year. And it's just going to go on and on and on. And actually, it's not worth it. It's really not worth it. And, and actually, I'm just thinking in the moment, should I touch that grey thing? And, 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 and if there's a risk of us, of course you shouldn't touch that grey thing. But if you've got a risk, if you've got the certainty of OCD, maybe you have to touch that grey thing that other people would be happy to touch. And, you know, if you're working with me, I would not get you to touch blue asbestos. I don't go <laughs> with blue asbestos or anything like that. So I do, I do safe things, you know, but, 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 you know, OCD will tell you they're unsafe. And I guarantee you it'll, it'll tell you it's unsafe. And that's the OCD speaking. And if you try and negotiate with the OCD by saying, yeah, but is it really safe? You're going to lose. It'll win every time. You know that, because you've got other types of OCD too. I'm going to move on if that's all right. Okay. Um, goals. Okay. If you want to get better, get this, this, okay, well, let me just tell you, uh, whoa, what happened there? This is the one I wanted. It's, my, it's probably my favorite slide. What's the, how's the caption go? There's a caption. Sorry? Not quite right. If you have OCD, it takes over your life. If you have OCD for a long time, it takes over your life for a long time. I've already talked about what happens between the age of 20 and 30 uh, and so on. <clears throat> and yeah, it's really important that if... And, and I've talked about the collateral damage issue, and it's really important that if you help somebody deal with their OCD, you don't just leave them with a great big hole in their life. And I've worked with people who are spending... 13 hours of each day doing OCD, and that's what they do. And when you, take it away, when, you, when you help them take it away, what do they do? And that's the importance of goals. And the three types of goals are short-term goals, medium-term goals, and long-term goals. Short-term goals, just constantly moving forward. Yeah? Medium-term goals, getting better. So if, if what well, part of your problem is you can't use public transport, using public transport is, is, is a medium-term goal. If you're, if, you're wash, if you're washing for 13 hours a day, then being able to wash for three minutes, to have a shower for three minutes, is a long-term goal. Sorry, it's a medium-term goal. So what are the long-term goals? And the long-term goals, in my view, in terms of nature, boring a vacuum are the important things. Many of you with OCD here will have sadly have given up the, your dreams, will have given up your ambitions. A couple of you have talked to me about the really sad fact, something we have researched as well, that people do not have children because of their OCD uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. So, so basically, long-term goals are people's dreams and hopes and ambitions. I'm going to tell you about one case, again, heavily disguised, and actually in one of the texts that we've that we've written, in, and it's a woman we'll call Alice, and, and from the age of 13 to the age of 27 or whatever it was, when we saw her, she had OCD, and that's what she did, and she stopped going to school and so on. And we talked quite early on about what her dreams were. And she said, I have no dreams, I have no ambitions, I have no... And, and I said, well, what did you think when you were 13? She said, I wanted to be a primary school teacher. And I said, okay, well, would that be a good long-term goal? And, and I swear her eyes fell straight out of her face and onto her cheeks. She completely gobsmacked at this idea. I said, well, you know, it's not going to happen next week. I mean, not even... But, but why not have that as a goal? And that's because, yeah, in the end, people with OCD don't seek help because they want to get rid of their OCD. They, they seek help because they want to live a life. So... Medium term, one of our, our short-term goals, by about session four with Alice, one of our short-term goals was to... Um, a whole series of other long-term goals. But anyway, just focusing on this one. one of the, she, we lived, she lived in London. One of the things that we asked her to do was to go on a bus, public transport, handling money, 
because back, it was back in the day when you had to, and uh, to go to the public library and to, and to read the most popular teacher training prospectus in the public library. No, nobody laughed. She laughed. She said, I know what you're up to. I said, what am I up to? She said, well, the most popular will be the dirtiest. I said, yeah, that's right. It would be. Of course it would. Yeah. Okay. And then, anyway, she comes back. She comes back the following session. And she's, she's been to Lewisham Public Library. And it was a bit difficult because, she's blah, you know, this and that and buses and money and library cards. And then she said she went to the careers bit and got, I don't know, Lancaster or somewhere. You know, uh, and, this, uh, and she thought, whatever, sat down. She said, an hour later, I came back. I said, well, where were you? She said, I was in teacher training for a whole hour. And I didn't have OCD. And so for, a, for this hour, she just sat there thinking, oh, this would be marvellous. And look, you get to do that. And that's what the courses are and so on. No OCD for an hour. And if she could do it for an hour, she could do it for the rest, the rest of her existence. And that is what she went on to do. And I mentioned this. So I'm very proud of the fact she's now the deputy head of a primary school. Wow. Yeah, okay, but <laughs> it took a long time. She had to go back to, you know, this is a long time ago. I haven't worked in London for a very long time now. So, <clears throat> but that raising your eyes to the horizon, not, it's not about the muddy puddle you're standing in. It's about the teacher training prospectus, which takes you to teacher training and which takes you to real life and so on. It's reclaiming your life, and that's such a hard thing to do. And that is what... You need to do, you need to think about reclaiming your life because, because otherwise nature will abhor the vacuum and if you get rid of your contamination of fear, something else will rush in and so it's about that, it's about that. And it's difficult and, yeah, and so on. Okay, so a couple of things about therapy itself. Just to, just to remind you, you know more about your problem than your therapist does and, and, and that's easy to forget. Yeah, and you really, you know, if, I'm doing, if you're doing therapy with me, I want you to help me, because I really can't do it without you. It's because you're going to do the work. You will know, you might, in some instances, know more about OCD than your therapist do. Remember the, the, the guy in Bangalore? He actually, I think he knew about as much uh, about OCD as, as, as most of the people working in Janardin's clinic, and that's not a criticism of Janardin's clinic. It's quite the opposite. Therapists will need your help, but some therapists are not prepared to admit it. So help the poor sausages, they are struggling. Uh, try to be active and collaborative. And again, therapists struggle with that, so you need to help them. And ask if your sessions can be audited. These days, yeah, there's a miracle of the mobile phone. Yeah. And, and, and you, know, you mustn't secret record, in the same way as a therapist mustn't secret record. But you say, would it be okay if I just put this on record on the desk? And if they say no, tell the bugger off. Sorry, done that again. I'm not supposed to swear in these sessions. I'd love to have a parental advisory on the video. What can I say? So, <coughs> so a, a good audio record. These, I, this is an old slide, actually. I have to realise I dug this out. It, it, the mobile phones do it. Um, listen to the recordings, make notes, develop your own therapy manual, and, and, and feed it back to the therapist. It's really helpful as a therapist when people tell me they listen to the recording of the session. And they learned that, that, and that. I think, oh, OK. That, and I can tell you, it's not usually the things that I thought they learned. It's usually better than the things I thought they learned and so on. Ask questions. You're really entitled to ask your therapist questions. Excuse me, do you mind if I... Does anybody want to ask any questions? Please. I guess one of the hardest parts about therapy is doing behavioural homework. One of the hardest parts of therapy, I'm just saying so, is about doing behavioural homework. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice in respect to that? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's see where I'm going to get to. I think I'm going to get to that, but I'm not sure. Uh, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm just going to do these then because I'm going to run out of time. But please, yeah. Does this work for disgust? Yes, it works for disgust OCD. You don't actually fear that anything bad happen. It works for depression OCD, disgust OCD. I Um, you can challenge the, the idea, the meaning behind the disgust or the anger and so on, because it doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, so the, the, I think it's, 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 it's a bit of a red herring about disgust. I mean, disgust, the, we've done some research on disgust, and disgust is disgust. Things which are disgusting amplify 
the feeling of discomfort, basically. And the uh, five minutes left. I knew I was going to get there. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, and so on. So, so it's not different. And certainly all the stuff about you know, getting to know your therapist and having goals and so on, that's all there. And so on. In the end... In the end, again, when we're back to things like behavioural, um, behavior, you know, behavioural tasks, behavioural experiments, which is what I describe them, you, then you want to look at things like, you know, so that if you get, you're going to get to a point where basically, you know, you 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 you're, you, you know that it's going to be very difficult, but you might have to go and stand in vomit in the street, yeah, and 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 and, and if you're supported in that process, and then find out what happens when you do that, and it's about finding out the reality of that rather than talking about it endlessly that's important. So, so behavioural experiments, as far as I'm concerned, are simply a continuation of the discussion you're having in the rest of your therapy, and they're about finding out what really happens. So I don't know what will happen, and I'm just choosing a random example, but if I took you out and stood you in the middle of, uh, of, some, of some drunk's vomit, yeah? Yeah, which probably don't make you feel very good even talking about it. But anyway. and, and I wouldn't do that without a fairly major... Um, lead up and so on, but then, I, but then I'll be entirely open f- to find out what's going on for you. And actually, I would. The other thing about this is, I will never do anything with somebody that I'm not prepared to do myself and more. So I would probably dip my hands in the vomit before I make you stand it, and I wouldn't make you before you agree to stand in it. And so, and it's about helping people discover how the world really works, and it's about being alongside the person. It's a, and, and, and in terms of doing behavioural experiments, finding out what's going on. It's about a really collaborative thing where you and your therapist are finding out with genuine curiosity on your part and his part or her part, you're more terrified than they are. But actually, that's not always true. Again, when it's interesting. Well, somebody, I was talking to somebody earlier about Karen Robinson, who, who, who's somebody who got better from OCD. He's got a wonderful blog, Karen Jane Robinson. Have a look at it. And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, Karen has helped me with training a lot as, as somebody who's, who's recovered. And she basically says, look, most therapists are not prepared to put their hands down a lavatory. So she, she and I would say, makes, but she encourages strongly with moral pressure all the therapists in our, um, in our uh, uh, workshops to put their, put their hands down the lavatory. And it's interesting how many really struggle with that and how hard it is to do. Um, but then actually, then we're talked back to the personal experience because actually some of those therapists then find it helpful to say, you know what, I couldn't do that. It's kind of helpful to you to hear that somebody couldn't do that themselves and then how they overcome it. And it's not the same because they don't have OCD, but it's helpful to know what the process was. And I'm pretty much out of time, aren't I? Um, don't be too kind to your therapist. Therapists have a self-protecting bias. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to explain that. They do. Therapists think that if anything goes right... That's because they're great therapists, and if anything goes wrong, it's your fault because you've got a personality disorder. Um, <laughs> okay, so, 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 so I'm actually not joking, I'm afraid. I wish I was joking, but I'm afraid that is one of the things here. Homework, you know, we're back to things like, you know, sort of behavioral experiments and so on. Um, make sure that, that your therapist gives you stuff to do, to read, to think about, to listen to tapes, um, and make sure. Yeah, my, I've been to so many workshops where therapists talk about ooh, how to motivate your patients to, 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 to do their homework. My son knows, or knew when he was nine, what the problem was. So basically, it's very simple. Yeah, the therapist sets your homework and they don't ask for it back. They don't talk to you about it next session. And then they set you some more homework. My son did not do homework for the teachers who didn't ask for it back, didn't mark it, and so on. And do you know what? That's what you should do too. If your therapist isn't going to mark your homework, don't do it. Um, but you might want to get them to think about whether they should be and so on. I'm going to have to finish. I'm going to finish on this note. There's a whole load of other slides, but I'm out of time and out. a couple of moments for discussion. Is that two minutes? Was that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> beware of the pessimistic therapist. Yeah. And I get accused of my, by my colleagues of being relentlessly optimistic. And I accept the charge. I am relentlessly optimistic because I've never seen anybody who couldn't actually improve. And we're back to this thing about parity of esteem. You know, why on earth would we tolerate you know, the kind of things that go on in mental health? And OCD, it happens particularly. Why would we let the, the people say, well, you've had five sessions and you're not making any progress, so that's it. Your tumour's not, not shrinking. No, it's really... 
Hey ho, so if you look into your therapist's eyes and despair looks back at you, you might want to try and do something about that. And that might be getting another therapist, that can be hard. It might be trying to encourage the therapist into, into motivating them and, and, and get them to the point where they, could, where they could see that there might be some hope for you and so on. It's a tough thing, and I'm sorry you have to do it, but that's how it is. Okay, so any last questions before Colette kicks me off the stage? I'm not on the stage, so she can't. Yeah, go on. What you say about long-term goals, I yeah. think, is really important. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to take it away and use it. But obviously, it's a bit different if you get diagnosed when you're 25 as when you're 45. Mm -hmm. yep. So how does a therapist work with somebody... Later in life, okay. So it's yes. about goals later in life, okay. And, 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 and there's, there's, there's a couple of answers to that. Um, and, 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 and one of the answers to that is, one of the things I contend with, with people who have had a very long period of OCD and who, particularly those who then get better, is the, the tremendous grief that people experience. The, 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 the grief and sometimes even self-hatred. You know, why on earth? If I could do this now, why couldn't I do it 25 years ago? And there's very good reasons why you couldn't. And so, so that's one thing. And it's really important to recognise that if you are in that situation, there's grief. And then the other thing is, is there is always a long-term goal. Yeah, OK, so the grief is about the, the lost goals. And I had this. I was supervising one of my... One of, I, won't, I won't say who it was, but, but I was supervising a very good therapist, and, and, and he was treating a woman who had had OCD since she was 13 and she was 75 at the time she finally got treatment and she was doing really well in treatment and I said to said therapist in supervision, what are the long-term goals? And he said, oh, she's 75. <laughs> long-term goals. Excuse me, yes. And he didn't, he absolutely didn't do it in that way. But he said, no, he hadn't because of her age. And, and so I said, go back, long-term goals. And actually, the, yeah, and she was really keen on long-term goals. And she said, you know what? I've never been out of the UK. I'd like to go to Paris. That's my long-term goal. It wasn't a long-term goal. It was a medium-term goal. Because on session five, she got on the Eurostar with her daughter and the therapist. And they went to Paris to get dirty. <laughs> uh, Paris is a very good place to get dirty, so I'm told, and so on. And that's, that, yeah, so there's always a long-term goal. And, it, and it's why you would do stuff. I mean, why would you even continue living? So if there's a reason for you to continue living, then there are, there are things to achieve. And that might be, you know, doing wonderful things. I've got you. Doing wonderful things with, uh, with, with OCD Action. It could be any number of things. You know, going back to... I, I, was, I had dinner yesterday in, in my college at Oxford. And there's a 75-year-old bloke who's doing, who's doing his first degree. You know? Yeah, that, OK. So, so go figure. Please, last, last question, I think. OCD and they maybe didn't even know what it was and it's become yeah. really entrenched. Yes. I think it's very brave of that person to be trying, obviously it, it, they want to escape from it but it's yeah. very brave of that person and I think it might require sort of, I don't know how to put it, but obviously it's very difficult for someone who's had it for so many years, it's so entrenched and it's hard for them to know I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to disagree with you, because I, uh, myself and my colleagues, Victoria, uh, Fiona, um, uh, oh, Claire and so on, we did, we did a series of research studies, which are published now, uh, called Tales of the Unexpected. Mm. Yeah? And it was because we were fed up of therapists saying, well, yeah, she's 75, why should she have long-term goals? Or, or she's had this problem for... Going to... And the, the thing that we came, there's two things we came across, one of which is people saying things like, well, if it's very chronic, it's not going to get better. Is going to be very entrenched. Well, I wasn't saying no, 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 I know. No, I'm just using this as a vehicle to give you this, but let me just tell you what we found. And then the other thing was about people who developed OCD when they were young, before the age of puberty. Okay, and, and we take that one first. Developing it before the age of puberty or after the age of puberty, and we're seeing them in their 40s and 50s or whatever, right? And people say, oh, well, before the age of puberty, it's neurologically different. And so they're not going to do as well with psychological treatment. Actually, what we found is people who, were, who, who started before the age of 12 did better in treatment. They got a bigger improvement. But that's because they started higher, but they ended up at the same place. So that wasn't a disadvantage. And the other thing was people with more chronic problems, the rate of change in treatment of OCD is exactly the same. But the collateral damage is bigger. So if it's the, yeah, but the OCD improves at roughly the same rate. 
Because when people, people didn't know what it was, and then they find out what it is, kaboom, they get it. One other thing, I'm just going to finish, because I'll just finish by telling you about the other tale of the unexpected. Um, sorry? No, it's not in a bit. No, it's actually in journal articles. And it was because, again, and it did this thing. I'm a fairly passionate sort of bloke, uh, certainly in this kind of forum. And, and, and I was fed up of this, of this thing of personality disorder, which I hate. I do not believe. I don't know that there are things which, ha which are pervasive with people, but the idea of personality, the idea of a diseased personality, is ridiculous in my view. Anyway, we, were see, we see, you know, in, in, in the context way, an awful lot of people with OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. <laughs> and so Olivia Gordon, myself, and, and Claire and other people uh, decided to look at this. And what we did, we just took all the people from the Maudsley Specialist Unit who had, uh, we took, a, 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 we got, I think, 47 people who had OCPD and OCD. OCD was the main problem, the OC, OCPD. And then 47 people, same age and gender, roughly, who had OCD without OCPD. And then I remember, we, we analysed how well they'd done in therapy. And I remember um, Olivia bringing me the, the results, and I said, Olivia, you've got them the wrong way around. Can you just go back and check it? So there's me checking, right? I don't have OCD, but I'm checking. And she brought it back and said, no, it was right. And I said, well, can I have a look at it, please? And I checked it, and I checked it, and she checked it, and somebody else checked it, and we all checked it. Uh, but it was right. The people who had OCPD did significantly better than the people who didn't have OCPD. So this OC, OCPD, which makes therapists go, oh, my God, this person's got a personality disorder as well as OCD, they did better in treatment. Why? In very short, because otherwise Colette is going to kick me. <laughs> the, the, it's probably, we don't know, because we couldn't find out why in that particular study. But OCPD is about perfectionism. So, and, and I'll tell you one story, which is, which is somebody at follow-up who would probably meet diagnostic criteria for OCPD, telling me that they'd really, what they'd really found helpful, this is a year after they'd finished treatment and got better, saying what they found really helpful was we'd done an intensive, we'd, we'd put our hands on the lavatory and then we'd had lunch and, and done it. And she said, done that every day since. Wow. Okay. And what OCPD is perfectionism. And so this was, and, and I then said, it's a bit of a ritual, so maybe... Maybe do it once every year, It'll be fine. And, and probably she'll do it once every year and so on. But, but actually people who are perfectionistic will listen to the tapes and they'll do their homework and they'll, you know, and the, and they'll, read, they'll read the stuff that you've done and so on. It's not that people who don't won't, but I think they'll probably do it more. So, so it's not a disadvantage, it's an advantage. So, so whatever is going on in your life, you can in principle, not whatever, a lot of things that are going on in your life you can turn into an advantage rather than disadvantage. Thank you very much. There'll be questions later as well. Thank you.